It sounds pretty straightforward enough, isn't it? I'm a material scientist. Many of you here will have no idea what that is. That's fair. But it, it basically, materials are all around you. You're sitting on them. You're wearing them. This whole building's made of them. This laptop's made of them. You know, it's more important than any other discipline. That's the summary. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I'm passionate about it, just like you are passionate about your own disciplines. And I want to just tell you a story about an epic failure of a project uh, that I feel worse about because it kind of encapsulated everything I was trying to do at the time. And I have, I've learned stuff from it, and I suppose that's the moral of the story. But let me just take you through it as it goes along. And um, I've got, I'm basically going to show you some, interview, uh, some videos that we made, and they can kind of... Um, in fact, I'm going to get my notebook. <laughs> I should have brought that up here, shouldn't I? Uh, I did make some notes. Hold on. It's not good for the film, that one. Is it okay? Yeah, good. Okay, I made some notes. Yeah. So I, wanted, I want to tell you about this because, and I need to give you a bit of a technical background to it. So we're, we're all wearing stuff. We've got amazing kit. You've got smartphones, perhaps, in your hands. Where does that stuff come from? And what, what kind of research process leads to a, an object like a mobile phone? Um, and we, you know, these research projects happen, and we applied for one from the EU. It was a five million euro project. And as these things go, you're probably familiar, or if you're not, you have to have representation from all over Europe, or at least cover lots of it. You have to have industry and you have to have academics. And that's like a big team. And we had 17 organizations, nine countries represented. And what did we want to do? Well, we, there was this whole group of people who, who had developed OLEDs, organic light emitting diodes. You didn't think this was going to be a technical talk to you, but it, it, it'll, it'll be fine, don't worry. <laughs> Now, what are OLEDs? You, probably, you might have them in your pocket and your phone. The screen of your phone is very likely to be either an LED screen, light-emitting diode screen, or an OLED screen. They're the latest, very bright, colorful screens. So this technology was around. Um, but people wanted to make flexible OLEDs. And in fact, Samsung launched, so this is quite a while ago, this project, finally launched out of this a foldable mobile phone. I don't know if you saw that earlier this year. It immediately didn't work, and I wasn't surprised. Um, and that, will, that leads into this talk. Basically, folding a screen, having it on a flexible substrate, is very, very difficult. They don't like it, all the materials inside it. But anyway, that was, that was one of the things we wanted to do. And the other thing was we wanted to match those materials, with, which were called piezoelectric materials. And these are in this microphone now. So basically, the pressure from my sound of my mouth is going into the air pressure. It's compressing it and then expanding it. That's going and hitting a material inside the microphone, which is making it go down and up. And that material is a piezoelectric material. And it turns that pressure difference, or that shape change, into an electrical signal. So if you change speech into digital, it's piezoelectric materials. They're all around your life. <laughs> you don't have to worry about them. But what, what if you could make touch-sensitive, flexible materials? What could you do with it? So we thought, oh, man, that just the world is just so ready for these materials. <laughs> and we had all these partners all around Europe, and we were going to put them all together. But we thought, what we want to do is move it into fashion. We want to move it into healthcare. We want to move it into areas where people care about. And so we want to get designers on board. So here, we're boiling up the project at this point, emails, Skype calls. <laughs> and we're going, to, we're going to put the OLED people with the Piso people. We're going to get the designers involved. And it's going to be great. OK. All sounds good. Just the stuff for EU projects, I think you'll agree. And let me just give you the promo video, or a little bit of it. You, won't, you probably won't. Hold on, it's not working, is it? Oh, yeah, there it is. That we kind of came up with to kind of take you into this why the rationale for this. Is that working? A little bit. Full screen. It's Got it. Before the light touch matters, light touch yeah. matters. Material scientists have got further and further away from designers, makers, architects. You see that in the built environment, you see it in the objects around you. The crafted object that has human qualities, but also has that beautiful 21st century technology in it, those things are not being made. So you have the kind of beautiful jewellery and beautiful design, which are mostly inanimate stuff, has lovely aesthetic qualities, and is made by traditional methods. And then you have high-tech stuff like smartphones and laptops, and, and there's a massive gap in the middle. In this project, we're trying to bridge a gap between the way designers work and the way material scientists are working and thinking. 
the main objective is to make an investigation and also a collaboration between designers and material scientists. So this method of working together is what I see as the most important and unique about the project. The opportunity of bringing these two people together is I think we'll create a built environment that is much more expressive of the human condition. You can't solve big problems unless actually you're very technically savvy but also is very sensitive to the environment and humans. I think that's the massive goal here. It's all about exploring different possibilities and we have a frame. Okay. There's uh, well-being in healthcare. You get the idea. Okay, so everyone's excited about it. We get the grant. Five million euros. Nice. So. At that point, uh, we've got the brief, we've got the organisations, we all start to get together, and we're bringing together this community of designers and this community of material scientists from all over Europe. And we've got this, sort of like, we're going to do it in healthcare, because it turned out healthcare was the area that was the most appealing to the funders, and we'd already checked that out with them. So we needed, some, we needed to kind of deliver. We had four years to do it. And so we started off doing the normal sort of research processes, trying to get together. And then we hit a really big problem, which was that people started to hate each other, but really fast, like much faster than often happens in projects, because usually you hate each other right at the end, right, because you spent too much time together and you've had all these deadlines. But people hate each other right from the beginning. And this was, this was puzzling. And I just want to kind of um, show you, well, I, I, you can see these headings on here. And, and, at the end, I'm going to give you this link. You can go away and look at some of the, the problems. But I want to show you one of the, um, just to illustrate how it happened, by showing you what one of the designers came up with as an application for our material. So once we'd made this material, what could you do with it? Let's see if this works. So it's in healthcare, right? So he had this idea. He's from Lamb Industries. He's a designer. Eight people in their rehabilitation from a traumatic injury or an operation it came about when I designed some surgical instruments few years ago, when I spoke to the surgeons, they said that a successful outcome was 50% down to how well they did the operation and 50% down to how well the patient did their physiotherapy. So what this product does, it makes it easy for people to know what angle they bent their leg to. So it's based on the knee brace that you wrap around your knee. And the idea is you put this thing on and it can automatically calculate the angle that your leg's at. So you set the number of repetitions you need to do, you set the angle you need to exercise to, it pretty much does the rest. It gives you a very visual feedback and it's up in the area, which is a kind of natural dashboard for you. It allows you to confidently do your exercises and hopefully recover better. The reason the LTM material is really good is because it's very thin and flexible. Because it has the touch sensitivity, it can act as a switch and record the settings you've been advised by the health professional. It also has a very bright light so you can concentrate on doing the exercise properly. I had the idea before, but it didn't really make sense if you had to have something that you wore with buttons embedded in it and lights and things like that. The opportunity to have something that's very thin and almost feels as if you're not wearing it, it gives you very good feedback visually and very easy inputs to make the settings that made the idea come to life. Light touch matters was the perfect material to make this idea come so, to fruition. So here's a designer, he's got a good idea, he had this idea before, he's worked with surgeon, he's perfect for us. And, and that prototype is existing materials and it's very clunky and you could never wear it as a real garment um, and it would never work. But if we had our material, a flexible material that you could sense pressure changes and changes in shape and then light up, he could make that thing. We could all have one. In fact, you could have, you know, imagine you were recovering from a shoulder injury, you could... You could, you could wear it, it could monitor and show you in visual feedback whether you were doing your exercises correctly. I mean, you could, this could be massive, right? And he was like, this project is going to leap me from this idea to multi-million, could be billion dollar, big thing. Anyway, so we explained to him that we actually don't have the material and that the whole project is for us to get the material, but it probably was going to take us three years of lab work to get any kind of material he can actually test. So then he's like, well, what am I going to do in the three years? And we're like, good point. Um, and so this is one of the big problems, is that our time frame for delivering a material that he could actually put into a garment was about three to four years, which was the length of the project. But it turned out the design framework and the, design, the time of designers was, well, two or three months for an idea. Then they wanted to get a prototype and another prototype. Then they wanted to go to a manufacturer. So we had completely different ideas of what this project was going to deliver. And how did that work out? It's because we didn't really communicate to them that we were doing research science and that this wasn't a developmental process. This was actually kind of deep science. And if you remember, as I said, Samsung launched their first foldable 
OLED today and without even press sensitivity. And it still didn't really work. <laughs> and we were trying to do that way back, that kind of thing. So we, it's incredibly technically difficult. And Samsung are a massive company. And we were an EU project with a big budget, but not that big. So immediately, this started to happen, that they were worried about us. And then another thing happened was that we would ask them to present stuff uh, in these meetings that we'd meet up with. And the scientists in the room started to think that designers were a bit superficial. I know that's not a good example of one. <laughs> um, that's a really good idea. But some of the ideas they brought to the table, they thought were a bit crap. They thought, I could have come up with that. <laughs> How come you're being paid to do this? I can come up with loads of ideas. What we're doing is really hard, and what you're doing seems really easy. And so as the meetings went on, um, this divide between the two communities that we were meant to be working with started to separate, like a sort of phase separation. And um, basically, it turned out when we asked and when we kind of got wind of this and, and realized that it wasn't working, was that the scientists didn't respect the designers, thought they were a bit sort of shallow. <laughs> and that the designers thought the scientists had misrepresented what they could do in this project. And now they were signed up to, doing, to have, meeting all sorts of outcomes, which were impossible unless they had the material. So um, this was a car crash of a project, and people got more and more annoyed and started not coming to meetings. But of course, we're all signed up contractually to do it, so that was bad. And um, what to do next, you might ask. Um, so in the end, we kind of found our way through to the end. And I think the main point about it was not that we ever made the material, which we didn't, um, but we kind of discovered things about how to how, why that failure came about, and in the end, how to, to avoid that failure in the future. And then we made a video <laughs> about that. That wasn't the only outcome of the project, by the way. It was well, mon well spent money in lots of other ways. But um, can I just show you, and I'm just going to play you a little bit of that end video, because I want to stop it at certain points and decode what people are saying, because um, you know, I was there, and I, you know, it, some of this is in code, what, what they're saying. OK. OK, so this is the reflections of the failure. Well, we would never say that. OK. When the call for research came, designers challenged to show what it could do to materials research. And now, five years down the road, we actually can say, yes, if you involve design in the right way, the materials research will get better. It will get to the market in an easier way. I think the main achievement is the fact that we've brought these two groups of people together who wouldn't necessarily talk. Of course, the aren't on. And the main achievement is that we brought them together. We, we did that at the beginning. So, I mean, that's the... Uh, OK. And yet, it doesn't go that fast, even if you want it. Having lead-free PAG materials, transparent, roll-to-roll -roll printed OLEDs, the addition of the color effects, I think a lot of good science. All theoretical. Done. It was very interesting, very intense, also a bit stressful. A demo, but not the material, another material. Because of but we had to have something. Mindset and way of thinking, the designers can really motivate the researchers, and they can really make this a case of this is what it could look like, and then you get this picture in your mind. This is one of the crucial demos people hated from the science point of view. This was to help kids eat, and had, the material had the lights that would light up near vegetables. <laughs> Scientists thought this was a shit idea. <laughs> We're doing this amazing material, and you were coming up with these ideas. Anyway, it, it made it into the end. Motivation to maybe work harder instead of just seeing. I don't think it's a shit idea. You start to see products getting exposed to people who work and think in a completely different way it was very useful. Completely different way. <laughs> That's a scientist. Me, designers are really totally different class of people <laughs> than materials researchers. Communication. Nervous laughter. <laughs> this is after two years of hell. how to explain things in such a way that they understand what we can mm. offer. And this is a pretty cool product, this, actually. It's a, it's a resuscitator, but it takes you through what you're meant to do, and it knows how much pressure you're putting on because of our amazing material, which we never made. That was the crucial point. I've really come into contact with so many different design agencies. I do research in a laboratory, and it's been so exciting and wonderful to meet these real designers, to try and understand their needs from a real materials point of view. A pet? It was very important for Horst Center to learn what people really appreciate about all that technology. We used to look at it from a very technological point of view. Now you start the other way around. 
We then got a lot of feedback about what would be desirable and many of those we realized were not on our agenda and they are now. The product design is great. So we what's didn't really expect oh. that we get close Sorry. to market value applications, <laughs> but we do. Oh, yeah, it's we okay. I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. It was really nice to have the opportunity to create a concept that was not influenced by clients. We couldn't have done it without the help of the others. Without the OLEDs and the KSO technology, we wouldn't have been able to create this concept. How to mix design and research. We now have a white book for that. One of the most interesting aspects of this project was the methodology that we used. These three iteration cycles to repeat the same cycles but at different levels to optimize the final results. We went round and round in circles. From the very beginning, we would use the same words, but we wouldn't really be speaking the same language. We started out using PowerPoint, we tried reports. And that's a crucial moment. Okay. What she's going to say, in case that completely fails, is that we had to throw all the PowerPoints, all the graphs away. Uh, it made no difference. And what we ended up having to do is go into the lab together, and the institute maker was one of the labs, and we just, we just made prototypes together. And in the end, they learned what we knew, and we, we, alert, we developed the ideas with them. And that really worked in the end, but we didn't end up meeting the objectives of the, of the grant because we didn't make the material, because the material didn't turn out to be until you really needed for lots of these applications. And I suppose, I, just, yeah, I, wrote, I wrote a few things down here. Basically, I think in these, in, when you have a multidisciplinary team, you need to manage expectations really well at the beginning. And it's not, it's not enough to just go straight into the project. You have to actually spend a lot of time together working out, visiting each other's places of work, understanding what design is, in this case, but there might be some other disciplines that you're dealing with. And you can't underestimate how long that takes. That takes probably about six months before you even into your project, because they need to trust you. You're, 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 you're speaking a different language. And if you don't do that, which we didn't, you, um, you, you immediately endanger them in the end, sort of separating. They don't really understand you. You don't understand them. They start to hate you. You start to hate them. And I mean, it sounds, it sounds like hyperbole. But you know, when you're in that pressure situation, it's difficult, um, especially when someone's banging on with PowerPoint and, and, and you're, you, that's not the way you think. Um, so what we did then is we made, we thought we've learned a lot about how to take people through a multidisciplinary material science project in this case, but it could be other types of project. And we made, although you can't see this because this is now, we thought we'd, we'd learn, we'd, we'd, we'd find a way to make the other people learn. So we made a MOOC, a massively open online course which this is it, this is on our website, and if you go to the overview, it says this isn't just for developing this type of material, it's if you want to develop any type of material with two disciplines who don't normally work together, what it takes you through with our case studies, what the problems might be and how you might get over them. And we thought this MOOC could be a really good outcome of how to avoid failure in the future for these big projects that are really ambitious but involve people who think completely differently about a problem but the MOOC itself failed <laughs> uh, because I think, and I think this is the one thing I want you to take away from it today, is that people don't believe me how hard it is. They really don't believe it. And, and, in the, and I've now written and done lots of multidisciplinary projects. And you say to people, we're going to need six months together not doing this project, but just visiting each other's labs, understanding each other's work, being in each other's lives, doing a lot of social stuff together. Otherwise, we won't achieve anything. And they don't believe me. And I suppose that's all I wanted to say, really, was that I've learned from my mistakes. We now run much better multidisciplinary projects. We're running one at the moment called the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub, which involves finance, it involves you know, environmental science, it involves behavior change, it involves material science, it involves chemical engineering, it involves uh, biochemical engineering, it's you know, biology, it's all, we're all working together. But you know, what I learned from this disastrous project, I've now helped put into that one. And one of the things I said to UCL when we said this, we, we need to be co-located. All disciplines need to have a, a central office where we all live and breathe each other's work together. And UCL delivered on that, I have to say, and that has made that work so much better.